Hi guys, it's June the 2nd, 2020, and it's quarter to one in the afternoon on a rainy winter day in Hawke's Bay. You're listening to podcast number 43, which I've entitled Alter Diagrams, or something similar to that, and this is an introduction to this series on the Golden Dawn Alter Diagrams. And we're doing an introduction because I'm taking it for granted that there are a number of people watching this video who won't understand the connection between the subject of this coming series and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And why I've decided to choose this subject to uh, place in the podcast, overall podcast series. So we're going to discuss all that now, and it's probably not going to take as long as these podcasts normally are, um, but we'll see how it turns out. So the first thing that we need to get our head around in order to understand the importance of the Golden Dawn altar diagrams is where the concept for altar diagrams came from, and what the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is. So it's traditional in the Western Hermetic mystery tradition to teach occult knowledge through a school rather than one lone individual teacher teaching a single student or a group of students by himself. It's a rare kind of a situation historically speaking, in the Western Hermetic mystery tradition. Usually, education, serious education, uh, occurs through a school-type format. And while Hermetic schools are obviously different in a number of ways from uh, civil or government education, there are also similarities between them. So you have stages in education which begin at simple levels and there's a graded ascent through different classes up to the more serious uh, education subjects and uh, grasp of the subject. So going way back in history most of these schools were secret and probably originally in the in the West, in the actual West, uh, they were not only secret, but they were secret inside of monastic institutions, usually. So, uh, the first real coming out of an esoteric fraternity happened with the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross in the early 1600s, 1614 to be exact. And since that time, a number of different groups of people in the West have decided to mimic a kind of similar format for Hermetic schools based on the kinds of things that the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross uh, described about their own structure, works, their aim, um, and their methods of doing things. And um, this structuring of modern Western Hermetic schools became most prevalent during the 1800s. And so in the late 1800s, we find a group of high-ranking Freemasons, and by that I don't mean uh, Freemasons who were um, in control of the organization and the, and the like conspiratorial Illuminati, Illuminati kind of Um, uh, high-ranking concept, but they were just guys, like normal guys in Freemasonry who had worked their way up into the high degrees, which isn't an uncommon thing in Freemasonry. And because of the fact that Freemasonry had kind of uh, degenerated over the decades, over the centuries, and lost much of the original serious hermetic knowledge that it passed on, these 
high ranking, the small group of high ranking Freemasons in the late 1800s decided that they wanted to repair that situation. So they set about looking for a way of designing an occult school, a Western hermetic occult school that would make up for all the shortcomings that were in Freemasonry during their era. So what they did was they eventually came across a plan or a pattern for an occult fraternity which only had the absolute basic bits and pieces that were required in such a training system and that basic plan then had to be uh, filled out with all the necessary accompanying information in order to build a robust training system. So this new fraternity, this new occult school that they were going to build, because of their background in Freemasonry, of course, they constructed the new school on what we would call the Masonic pattern. In Freemasonry, no matter what degree you are taking, what level you rise up to, one of the first things that you will notice, and most Masons recognize this without really being consciously aware of the fact, but all of these rituals and degrees in Freemasonry are all built on the same pattern, and we'll call that the standard Masonic format or standard Masonic pattern. And because it was easiest for them, because of how much they knew about the Masonic system, it, uh, it was easiest for them to build this new school that they were considering based on a Masonic format. And in the end, what we ended up with in 1888, they launched a new school called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And we're looking specifically at this school because at the time when the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was created, it was a very unique system for a number of reasons. It contained information which you couldn't find in any of the other contemporary Hermetic schools. It was a complex system and its graded ceremonies were the most esoteric graded ceremonies that existed at that time. So we can say that when the school was launched in 1888, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, it was a secret society. Nobody outside of Freemasonry knew anything about it and they were very careful about how they selected their members. And at first they only selected other Masons who were used to the concept of secrecy regarding uh, ritual, ceremonial, esoteric degrees. And so they kind of beta tested the school and it worked so well that they then opened it up to non-Masons and then to female members, which I think was probably their ultimate goal. Because nothing else existed at that time that could come anywhere near to being as complex, as deep and serious and meaningful and emotionally moving to take part in, the curious thing about the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was once it was opened up and revealed to the public by a gentleman who went by the name of Israel Regardi, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn then became the primary source of knowledge and primary pattern for any new Western occult society, fraternity, esoteric organization that was being invented after the turn of the last century. So as we come into the 1900s, once that system was revealed to the public, people were so excited about it 
and it contained so much information and so much complicated ritual that if you were inventing or creating a new system, everything you needed was in that container of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So we can say that the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn uh, became like the standard format for Western occult groups that were created after the year 1900. At first, it was just other versions of the Golden Dawn that made use of that pattern, but then all kinds of groups, um, Wiccan, uh, mystical, um, esoteric fraternities, alchemical groups, all kinds of them started picking and choosing from the assortment box of Golden Dawn concepts, structures and ideas and build, built their own system. So it's very hard today to find any serious esoteric education system, any serious school, hermetic school or Western mystery school in the Western tradition today that doesn't contain reasonable chunks of the Golden Dawn system in some way. And usually without making reference to the fact that they poached those ideas from the Golden Dawn. Although if you're a serious student and study carefully, if you join a group and you study the Golden Dawn, just in theory, from the literature that talks about it, it's easy to figure out for yourself where the group you belong to has taken aspects of the Golden Dawn system. So this is how important the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is. No matter what you believe about that system yourself, no matter what your attitude about it is, whether you like the Golden Dawn system or dislike it or whatever, the fact of the matter is it's played an important historic role in modern Western Hermetism. And apart from its complexity and the beauty of its rituals, one of the reasons why it uh, plays such an important role is because somehow it ended up including in its instruction knowledge, very serious knowledge, about things like Kabbalah, for example, which didn't exist anywhere else in the Western Hermetic tradition. And that knowledge is serious, as I said, and accurate and deep. And nobody is quite sure where the gentleman who created the Golden Dawn actually got that information from. Although there are a number of pseudo-academic papers and research documents which provide ideas about where that knowledge may have originated from. But that's not really the subject of uh, this podcast. We don't want to go down that road here really yet, although I might to some degree at the end of the coming series if it looks like it's worthwhile discussing the origins of this knowledge. So that's the first thing we need to understand before we start talking about the altar diagrams is the importance of the Golden Dawn. Why pick the Golden Dawn? Why pick its altar diagrams? And the answer to that is simple. It's because of the importance of the Golden Dawn and it's because of the uncanny seriousness and accuracy of its Kabbalistic teaching. And that's important to remember of its Kabbalistic teaching. So the next thing we need to understand is what are altar diagrams and where did these things come from? And the answer to that is they came from the Masonic system. So one of the arguments about the origins of Freemasonry is that it originally came from medieval stone masonry, the dudes who built the Gothic cathedrals and the priories, commanderies for the Knights Templar and things like that, the stonemasons, and of course the carpenters and all that kind of thing. 
they group themselves into guilds and into lodges and they initiated and trained their stonemason apprentices and uh, fellow crafts or journeymen within their individual lodges and within their individual guilds. And all these lodges and guilds converged on a building site in order to uh, take responsibility for various aspects of building a cathedral, for example. One of the things that stonemasons used to do is they had a thing called a tracing board. And the master mason, the guy who was in charge of a specific lodge and all his journeymen and apprentices under him, for the day, at the beginning of the day, when he was getting ready to explain to everybody what the workload for the day was, he would take a big platform, like a sheet of paper or a canvas or an area of stone or something, and he would draw the basic plans for the day or for the particular, particular operation that they were involved in. And uh, he would uh, discuss those plans that he drew out on that surface with the uh, masons who were assembled for the morning discussion or for the weekly um, discussion or whatever. And that platform that he drew on, the paper or the, the parchment or the stone surface or possibly even a nice flat piece of ground, was called a tracing board. And so a tracing board was a thing you drew a plan for the work on. And that plan might be for a particular area that they were constructing, or it might be for a particular kind of a stone that they needed, say, 500 of, or something like that. And he would draw the, the shape of the stone, the dimensions, and make notes about any other things, so that each of the masons could look at the tracing board see what needed to be done, and then put the theory, the pattern, into uh, practical effect in their actual stone masonry work. So Freemasonry was said to have grown out of medieval, the medieval stonemason tradition. And there are pros and cons for that argument, but to a certain degree at least it was probably true. So what happened at a certain point in history was that not so many stone buildings were being constructed, so not so many stone masons were required. And so the number of stone mason companies or guilds or lodges dropped. And because the stone masons didn't want their entire system and culture to disappear, what the theory says is that then they turned their system into a kind of philosophic or speculative Masonic organization. And so in the lodges, instead of teaching apprentices how to actually carve stone, what speculative masons did was they took all the tools that stonemason used and all of the materials that they worked on and the jobs that they were supposed to do, and they used all of, of those things symbol, as symbols, symbolically, in order to teach lessons about hermetic philosophy and about um, morality, because that is the core instruction in speculative Freemasonry, is that it is a system of morality and ethics based more or less on a general religious approach to life. Not specifically Christian or any other religion, but uh, it grew out of a Christian environment uh, in the beginning. So speculative masonry in each of the three first degrees in craft masonry, the tools like the malls, the chisels, the rulers, the set squares, the plum rules, all of these things were turned into symbols and they were used to explain a system of morality. And one of the items that they used symbolically was the tracing board. 
So each of the three craft degrees has its own tracing board, and they are paintings which usually hang on a Freemasonic lodge's walls, or they're kept in a special cabinet of the room. And then, for example, when the apprentice degree is being worked, at the end of the, the degree, there is a lecture which is given by one of the brothers, uh, a lecture, and the lecture is usually called Charges, and it is on the apprentice tracing board, for example. So the tracing, apprentice's tracing board, the fellow craft tracing board, and the master mason tracing board are paintings, long rectangular paintings, which contain a whole bunch of symbolism that is so associated with the ideas that are being taught in that degree. So just as the medieval stonemason tracing board was used to draw the plan for the day or for the week or whatever on, it was the pattern or the plan that they were working from. In Freemasonry, the tracing board is the same thing. For each degree, the tracing board is the pattern or plan of instruction and work that is being provided to the candidate who is going through the ceremony. So more or less all of the degrees in Freemasonry up to a point have their own tracing boards. And the three most well-known ones are the three tracing boards from the first three Masonic degrees, Apprentice, Fellow Craft and Master Mason. So what happened when the Masons who created the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were building and filling out their system and adding all the bits into it, the teachings and the instruction for the ceremony and all that, what they did was they included this concept of a, a uh, tracing board, but they changed the name for it. Although it kept the same basic concept. So in the Golden Dawn system, the Masonic tracing boards are called altar diagrams. And they're called altar diagrams because in each of the degrees, these diagrams are brought out and they're either leaned up against the altar, which is more or less in the centre of a Golden Dawn temple, or they are rested on the top surface of the altar. Usually they're leaned up against the altar. And the candidate is brought round, and then just as in Freemasonry, there is a lecture or charge where the symbols on the altar diagram are discussed with the candidate the person who, the initiate who is being taken through the ritual ceremony. Um, so in the Golden Dawn system, similar to the Masonic one, there are altar diagrams or tracing boards for all of the degrees except the first two. So we have for this, uh, there's a, a zero degree, a one degree, a two degree, three degree, four degree, a portal degree, and a fifth degree. In the, begin in the original Golden Dawn system, that's how their degrees were set up. But in the, in the nought degree, or the zero degree, and the one degree, there were no tracing boards. So there were four tracing boards or altar diagrams in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn system. The second degree, the third degree, the fourth degree, and then in the fifth degree, a very complex uh, altar diagram or tracing board. And just as in the Masonic system, these tracing boards describe the pattern or the plan or the blueprint for the work that is being done with each candidate or student as they study and progress through the Golden Dawn system. Now, one of the curious things about the altar diagrams in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is, while every candidate who has been through a temple degree ritual, or every individual who has bought and studied the main instructional manuals for the Golden Dawn system, 
such as Israel Regardi's book, The Golden Dawn Encyclopedia, uh, they will have seen these altar diagrams and read the instruction for them, but there is not a great deal of information about the background history of where these diagrams came from, or in fact, why the altar diagrams are being presented in the ritual and how they should be viewed by the student or candidate and what further research, therefore, the student or candidate should enter into in order to understand at a deeper level what those altar diagrams are about. So everybody gets to see them who goes through that system or who has studied their instructional manuals, but very few people understand what they really are. And one of the things I find extremely curious about this fact is that out of all the dozens of books that have been written about the Golden Dawn system in the last 120 years, I can't think of one modern book that has been written about the Golden Dawn system which goes into any detail at all about the altar diagrams or what they mean. And this is why I'm producing this series of podcasts on the Golden Dawn altar diagrams in order to explain all the information about those diagrams that isn't included in the Golden Dawn instruction itself. And then to discuss where this information come from and what it means. So these podcasts on the altar diagrams are going to be complex and detailed and in-depth. And in order to understand what it is that I'm talking about, where this next series of podcasts is coming from, everything that I've produced up until now, all the podcasts up until now, 40 of them, um, need to be viewed, studied, and more or less memorized and understood. Otherwise, I'm going to be using a lot of technical language when discussing the altar diagrams that people who are not very familiar with accurate hermetic technical language will not understand much about what's being described in these upcoming uh, podcasts in this altar diagram series. So for now, all that I really want to say about what's going to happen is that I'm going to present drawings of these altar diagrams in the videos, but you might want to have a reference version of those drawings yourself. So it's easy to find these altar diagram pictures on the internet by simply Googling a Golden Dawn altar diagram and then going to the image search. And you, you're looking for four diagrams and the ones that you usually see online um, are scans of the ones that appear in Israel Regardi's The Golden Dawn encyclopedia book, the main manual that people use to study the Golden Dawn system. Um, so you can find pictures yourself and print them out to use as a reference when I'm explaining each diagram in the coming podcast. But you also might want the information that the Golden Dawn itself presents alongside these diagrams. And really, in order to get that information, you need to find yourself a copy of Israel Regardi's The Golden Dawn. There are actually two versions of it, a large hardback and a small paperback. And uh, you can usually find secondhand copies of the smaller 
black paperback, which is commonly known by Golden Dawn students as the black brick. Um, you usually find secondhand copies relatively cheap, and certainly while I'm discussing the altar diagrams, if you don't already have a copy of that book, it's good to familiarize, get a copy, familiarize yourself with it, find where the diagrams are that I'll be discussing, and then look for the accompanying references um, amongst the written part of the um, early stages of that Golden Dawn encyclopedia. Uh, it's a bit of an issue to navigate through that book if you're not familiar with the Golden Dawn system, so it's a good idea if you're going to um, follow along with what I'm saying by having a copy of Rigardi's book with you that you get one relatively soon and familiarise yourself with what's in the book and what the format is. Uh, also, if you do a Google search for the altar diagrams, you will find um, probably copies of more modern versions of those diagrams, some of them of which have been painted for use in actual Golden Dawn temples. And some of those diagrams vary slightly, but they all have the same basic symbolism and format. So just be aware that the standard accurate version is Rigardi's, the original version, and that there are later versions that have been produced, paintings of the older diagrams. Also that they are for the second degree, third degree, and fourth degree, and that there's one in the fifth degree, which is the lid of the pastos. In fact, the fifth degree altar diagram is the entire vault of the adepts, which you will also find diagrams of in Rigardi's book. So hopefully that has served as a useful introduction. I'm also going to give a disclaimer here uh, and say that while we're talking Golden Dawn, and while we're looking closely at the Golden Dawn altar diagrams, that I this does not mean that I in any way endorse the Golden Dawn as a system itself. My attitude, my personal attitude towards the Hermetic Golden Dawn is complicated. I used to be a member and I used to run a Golden Dawn temple which had direct succession from the Whare Ra temple in New Zealand and we ran that for three or four years which is where I learned most of what I know about the Golden Dawn from, from having to build a temple from the ground up, construct all of the equipment, learn what it all meant and then deliver the uh, ceremonial initiations to new candidates. So one of the reasons why I focus on the Golden Dawn system, apart from the fact of the importance it has historically to modern Western Hermetism, is because I was involved in that system myself. But I have not been involved in that system for quite a number of years now. And the reason for that is because I do not agree with the direction in which most of the groups who present themselves as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn today have developed their behaviour and their systems towards. Uh, a lot of the modern Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn groups really don't understand the system it's not being taught properly and a lot of changes have been made to that system and most importantly the politics in most of those groups have reached a the point where they are embarrassingly disgusting which is why I provide this disclaimer because I don't want anybody thinking that I'm encouraging anybody to get involved in the Golden Dawn or become a member. There definitely are good reasons to get involved in a group like the Golden Dawn if you've never been involved in temple ceremonial, group ceremonial before, and want to experience that. Uh, but 
when it comes to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and a good number of groups who operate under that banner today, there are issues which come along with being with joining such a group and wanting to uh, experience what they offer and learning their system. Uh, I do encourage, though, uh, to buy literature on the system that was written before 1960 and to study that in order to learn as much as you can about the format and structure and work of typical modern Western Hermetic school systems because you can't find anywhere near as much detail on that knowledge as you can uh, anywhere else outside of publications on the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Information about that group has been published more than any other group. And because it is kind of the uh, blueprint for most other groups, or at least the source from which they plagiarized a lot of their knowledge and practices, studying the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is very helpful in understanding how these groups operate and what they're trying to teach. So I think that's about it for now. Short-ish introduction and that will give an idea about what we're looking at in the upcoming series on the altar diagrams. And so in podcast number 44, we will begin with the 2 equals 9 altar diagram, what it looks like and what it means and uh, what we can learn from it. So thanks again for watching and let's hope I see you in the next podcast.